Welcome back, folks. Today we're going to be exploring our third fundamental theorem of vector calculus, Stokes' theorem. Turns out Stokes' theorem has a lot in common with Green's theorem, except while Green's theorem takes place in two dimensions, Stokes' theorem takes place in three dimensions. So let's quickly remind ourselves of what Green's theorem says. Green's theorem tells us that if we are trying to integrate some vector field along a simple, closed, positively oriented curve C, well, then that's the same as computing the double integral over the interior of that curve, except now we're dealing with this derivative-like expression that comes from our vector field. Now, this theorem is awesome because it gives us a way to connect line integrals to double integrals. Stokes' theorem does the same sort of thing, except we're connecting line integrals to surface integrals. So to set the stage for Stokes' theorem, try saying that five times fast, suppose that we have some surface S that has this ridge or edge given by the curve C. So S here just refers to this blob and it's open at the bottom. It's just sort of hard to show that. So C is the edge or the boundary of this curve. Stokes theorem tells us that if we were to integrate a vector field along the boundary, well, that's the same as integrating the curl of that vector field over the surface itself. So we have the same theme going on here. The integral of a function over the boundary of a region is equal to the integral of a derivative of that function over the inside of the region. This is super exciting because often one of these two integrals will be much easier to evaluate than the other, and it's important that we're able to transition between them. Before we jump into an example, we have a small but important matter to discuss, orientation. Remember, both the curve C and the surface S have some sort of orientation. And if we're going to be switching from a line integral involving C to a surface integral involving S, we need to figure out what happens to that orientation. Here's how I like to think of it. Suppose that we have some surface S that's oriented upward or outward. So the normals are pointing sort of like this. To figure out the orientation on C, well, what we're going to do is we're going to imagine a little man walking along the boundary curve with his head pointing in the direction of our normal vectors. So his head is going to be pointing up. He's walking upright in this picture. Now, he wants to keep the surface to his left side as he walks along this curve. So which way is he going to have to walk? Well, he's going to have to walk counterclockwise. So based on this orientation of normal vectors for our surface, we get a counterclockwise or positive orientation for our curve C. Another way that you can think of this is in terms of a bottle of pop. Maybe you have a bottle of Sprite and you're trying to take the lid off. So you would turn the lid this way, right? You'd turn it counterclockwise. And when you do that, the lid is going to move up. It's going to move away from the bottle, upward or outward, right? So this counterclockwise orientation on the boundary curve is giving us an upward or outward orientation on the surface. What if instead our surface S were oriented downward or inward? Well, again, we're going to imagine a little guy walking along the boundary curve C, and his head is going to be in the direction of our normal vectors. So this time, his head is actually pointing downward. He's on the underside of our boundary curve. Still, he wants to keep the inside of the curve to his left. So if you turn your head and you imagine what things look like from his point of view, you can imagine that he's going to have to walk in the clockwise direction. Right? So this downward or inward orientation on our surface is giving us a clockwise or negative orientation on our curve C. You can also think of this in terms of the bottle of Sprite. If you turn the cap clockwise this time, well now the cap is going to get tighter. It's going to move closer to the bottle. It's going to move downward. So the counterclockwise or negative orientation on our boundary curve is giving us a downward or inward orientation on our surface. Okay, let's check out an example so you can see Stokes' theorem in action. Here, we're looking to evaluate the surface integral of the curl of f, where here, f is this vector field, and we're integrating over s, the upper half of the sphere, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 9, oriented outward. Okay, well, if we're going to use Stokes' theorem, we know that we can trade this surface integral, the surface integral over s of curl of f, for a line integral. We could instead compute the line integral along c of f dot dr, where here c is this boundary curve, right? It's the edge of our surface. 
Now, if we're going to evaluate this line integral, we're going to need to know the orientation of C. Well, we're told that S is oriented outward, right? So if you think back to the Sprite bottle, this is like us trying to remove the cap. If we're trying to remove the cap, we would have to turn it counterclockwise. C is oriented in the counterclockwise direction. All right, if we want to evaluate this line integral by definition, we're going to have to look for a parametrization of our curve C. Well, C is the circle of radius 3 centered at the origin and traversed counterclockwise. So we could use the parametrization R of t equals 3 cos t, 3 sine t, and of course z is 0. t is going to range between 0 and 2 pi. So once again, we have our vector field f, the parametrization of our curve c, and we're trying to compute this surface integral, which we've traded out for a line integral. Thanks, Stokes' theorem. According to definition, this line integral is really the integral along c of f of r of t dot r prime t dt. So we should probably start by computing r prime. The derivative of r of t is minus 3 sine t, 3 cos t, and 0. So this is going to give me the integral along c of, okay, f of r of t. I'm going to replace x, y, and z with these expressions here. That's going to give me 0, 3 cos t, 0, and I'm going to dot that with my derivative, minus 3 sine t, 3 cos t, 0. There's only one surviving term. We have the integral from 0 to 2 pi of 9 cos squared t dt. From here, I'm going to use a trig identity to make my integrand a little friendlier. I'll factor out the 9. I have the integral from 0 to 2 pi, and I'm going to replace cos squared t with 1 plus cos 2t over 2. At this point, I'll take the 2 out and find an antiderivative. This gives me 9 over 2. My antiderivative is t plus sine 2t over 2, and I evaluate from 0 to 2 pi. It's not too hard to see that this sine term is going to disappear under both bounds, leaving me with a final answer of 9 pi. Now, folks, at this point, you should be pretty impressed. We were able to compute this surface integral quite quickly by converting it to a line integral. We didn't have to parametrize our surface. We didn't have to deal with that gross cross product business. Hell, we didn't even have to compute the curl of f. We saved a ton of time by using Stokes' theorem. Now, if you don't believe me when I say that Stokes' theorem was a huge time saver in the last example, think again. If we actually compute the curl of our vector field, I'll let you work through the computations, you should get the vector 0, z, 1. Now, does this vector field look familiar? It should, because this is the same vector field we used in the last video. In fact, in our last lesson, we computed the surface integral of this vector field over the exact same surface. Last time we called it S1, but it's still the same cap of the sphere of radius 3. With a fair bit of effort, we were able to show last time that the surface integral of this vector field was equal to minus 9 pi. Wait a second, minus 9 pi? Didn't we just show that the surface integral was 9 pi? We did, but this time we're using outward orientation. In the example from the last video, we were using inward orientation. So if we were to switch the orientation, we would expect the answer to be multiplied by minus 1. The point here is that Stokes' theorem saved us a ton of time. It's a fantastic theorem. I'm going to end this video with a couple cool remarks about Stokes' theorem. Firstly, suppose that we have two surfaces, S1 and S2, that have the same orientation and the same boundary curve C. So maybe S1 looks something like this. We have the boundary curve C oriented counterclockwise, and S2 looks a little bit more complicated, but still we have the same boundary curve C oriented in the same direction. Suppose now that we have a vector field F. According to Stokes' theorem, the surface integral of the curl of F over S1 should be equal to this line integral. But also by Stokes' theorem, the surface integral of the curl of F over S2 should be equal to this same line integral. Therefore, it doesn't matter if we integrate the curl of f over s1 or s2. We're going to get the same result. If you think about it for a second, that's insane. It means that integrating the curl of f over this crazy surface s2 should give the same result as if we integrated the curl of f over this flat surface here, which is no doubt much easier to work with. 
We just have to make sure we use the same orientation. Finally, I'd like to point out that Green's theorem is really just a special case of Stokes' theorem. Remember, Green's theorem helps us to evaluate line integrals over simple closed curves C in R2. But if we take one of those simple closed curves, we can imagine it in R3 by just plopping it down into the xy plane. Here's our curve C, and it encloses a region D. Now, since we're viewing all of this in R3, we can treat D like a flat surface. Maybe we'll call it S. According to Stokes' theorem, the line integral of our vector field along the boundary curve should be equal to the surface integral over S of the curl of F. Ah, but this is the surface integral of a vector field. So according to our definition, this is really the surface integral of the curl of F dot a unit normal vector n ds. But wait a second. If this surface is living in the xy plane, then it's perfectly flat. And therefore, a unit normal vector to our surface is this guy right here, k vector. Ah, so I could replace this n with a k. And really, if I'm computing the surface integral over a flat surface, that's exactly the same as computing the double integral over that surface. We're doing the same process. I could write this whole thing as the double integral over d of curl of f dot k dA. Ah, but at this point, folks, think back to our lessons on curl and divergence. There, we rephrased Green's theorem in terms of the curl, and we got exactly this. The line integral of f over c is equal to the double integral of the curl of f dot k over d. This is Green's theorem, and it followed immediately from Stokes' theorem. Pretty cool, huh?